Welcome to Enter the Unknown, your one-stop shop for answers to questions that you were never bored enough to ask. My name is FJ, and today we're returning to the Sinnoh region for what will be one of the most time-consuming and difficult challenges I've ever attempted. I wanted to do another challenge video that didn't require any use of the universal randomizer or map editing, because I haven't done one in a while. I was trying to think of a challenge where I could use only one move for the entire game that would be possible to complete and simultaneously interesting. Eventually I figured out that if I used Growl a few times in the early game in Pokemon Platinum, then I could move on from that point only using Bide. In Generation 4 they made it so Ghost-type Pokemon were no longer immune, even though Bide is a normal-type move, which made the whole playthrough possible. If you don't know how Bide works, well, it's basically like this. Once you choose to use Bide, you can't do anything for two turns. Your opponent is free to attack you or do anything else that pleases them. At the end of those two turns though, if you're still standing, you deal back twice the damage you took. So if you're in battle and your opponent hits you for 40 hit points of damage while you're using Bide, you deal 80 points of damage back to them once you can move again. That's basically it. This is going to make grinding incredibly frustrating, but I can do it. I think. The rules for this one will be pretty standard, I won't be using any items in battle, held or otherwise, I just feel like citrus berries and leftovers could make this pretty easy. Other than using growl a few times early on to make sure we don't use another attack, we can only use bide for the entire game. That's really the whole thing. As always, I'm going to try to stay at a reasonable level if possible, mostly because I don't want to spend any more time grinding than I have to. Okay, with that I think we're ready to get into it, so let's go. Can you beat Pokemon Platinum using only Bide? We choose Piplup for our starter and then jump into the first battle of the game. Obviously Piplup doesn't know Bide yet so we just growl until Barry manages to knock us out. It takes him quite a while. We actually ended up using Growl 23 times before his Turtwig finally finished us off. Luckily you don't need to win the first rival battle in Pokemon Platinum so we can move on and get to nicknaming our Piplup, Peepo. Now it's time to pick up a Pokemon who can actually use Bide right away, so on Route 101 we go about catching ourselves a Cricketop. The bug type learns our required move at level 1, so after naming her Mara, we jump right into grinding. Once we've got her up a few levels, we take on the first trainer in the game. Even though he only has one level 5 Starly, we still almost lose from two levels above, but just about scrape through with the win. Not long after, we make it to level 10 and Mara evolves into Cricketoon. Then we get right back into the thick of it with a rival battle. Barry leads off with his level 7 Starly, and we bide. Obviously. That's going to happen a lot. Barry spends way too much time using Growl, which doesn't affect us, but after a while he starts attacking, and we take out the flying type with more than half of our HP remaining. Then Barry sends out Turtwig, who seems equally unwilling to attack. The Grass Starter raises his defense repeatedly by using Withdrawal, which also makes no difference to bide. After Mara unleashes the energy built up, the opponent has a free turn to attack before we can set up Bide again. It's unfortunate and it makes this challenge incredibly… well, challenging, but with 2 HP remaining, Mara pulls out the win. We make it to Orberg City where we meet Rourke and challenge him for our first gym badge. The weird thing about only using Bide is sometimes having a weakness to your opponent is an advantage. There's nothing more frustrating than taking 20 odd turns to knock out a Pokemon because it can barely deal any damage to you. So when Geodude uses Rock Throw, it guarantees its fate. The level 12 Rock type goes down easily, forcing the Gym Leader to send out his Onyx. Two more Rock Throws do enough damage to Mara for our Retaliation to be another one hit KO. Unfortunately, by this point, Cricketoon has almost no HP left. Rourke's Cranidos easily finishes her off, and we're forced to bring in Peepo. He has to use Growl once because we're still a long way from learning Bide, but ultimately our first run at a gym ends in failure. The Rourke battle is a great place to grind though. Geodude and Onyx earn us a whole lot of experience from Mara, and once we're up to level 21, we come back for a second try. Well, it's not really a second try. I've been grinding here for ages, but it's the second try that you're seeing, so it counts. Geodude always goes for Stealth Rock as one of his first two attacks, so we only ever have to deal with one Rock. With Mara taking 18 hit points of damage, we have just enough energy built up to knock him out. Onyx comes out next and does 24 points of damage with two attacks, which lead to his downfall and takes Rourke down to just one Pokemon. 
His Cranidos is sent out and Headbutt takes off 60% of the health we have left. That seems to be the end. One more Headbutt will absolutely knock Krikatoon out. Knowing the pain of what was to come, the Pokemon gods smiled on me and Cranidos went for pursuit, allowing Mara to survive on 1 HP. The bide we fire off is good for yet another one hit KO and earns us the Coal Badge. This was not easy. Nothing in this challenge will be. Moving on. At Valley Windworks, we can finally add another team member who knows Bide in the shape of Pachirisu. After naming him Suri, we head inside to take on one of the 14 Galactic Commanders, Mars. Pachirisu lives through two bites from her Zubat and then deals back double damage for an easy win before we send in Mara to eat up some hits from her ugly. After two hits, our Bide falls just short of knocking out the Fat Cat, but at the second time of asking, Krikatoon gets the job done. Even when things go well, we're still just about scraping through battles. Our next stop is Eterna Forest, where we meet up with Cheryl who accompanies us through. In our double battles, her Chansey does all of the attacking, so we can just sit there with Peepo and get some free levels. We've slowly been switch training Piplup and now it's finally paying off. At level 22 he learns Bide and evolves into Prinplup for good measure. With our whole team now knowing Bide, it's time to leave the forest and take on the Eterna City Gym Leader, Gardenia. She leads off with her level 20 Turtwig and we start with Peepo. With Reflect and Razor Leaf, our first bite is good enough to give us an early advantage. Gardenia sends in Cherim next, and we swap out to Suri. It starts off okay, but Leech Seed quickly becomes an issue, and before too long, Pachirisu goes down. With Peepo already weakened from his face-off with Turtwig, he can't survive through two turns and falls before being able to unleash the energy from Bide. Mara is out last, and one Bide finishes off Cherim to take it down to a one-on-one. -on -one. Unfortunately for us, Rosary leads off with Stun Spore, and that means we only have one attack to work with for our Bide. If Rosary had gone for back-to-back -back Grass Knots, this would have been the end of things, but instead we can only chip away half of her health. Rosary attacks from there on out though, and Mara goes down. That's another gym battle loss, so it's probably time to add another team member. En route to 11, we pick up a Meditite, who also knows Bide, and nickname him Asanan. After several more attempts at the gym, and a whole lot of grinding, we return to take on Gardenia with our levels closer to where they need to be. We can speed through most of this battle because somehow we end up in the exact same position as last time. Cherim low on health, Rose Raid yet to appear, and Mara remaining as our only hope. We get the best result possible against Cherim as she only uses one magical leaf instead of two. Rose Raid hasn't changed though. She starts with Stun Spore and we get a bit screwed over by Paralysis. Two more Magical Leaf hits take Krikatoon below 10 HP, but the Energy Unleashed from Bide finishes off Roserade and earns us the Forest Badge. Out of interest, did you know that Gardenia is an anagram of Angerade? Seems fitting. We have to make a quick stop and deal with Team Galactic before we can leave Eterna City behind and make our way to Heartholme City. Commander Jupiter isn't up to much against our team of four though. Our next major battle is against Fantina in the Heartholme Gym. If I keep showing you failed attempts at gym leaders, this is going to be a very long video, so let's just shorten things a bit and say, our first few runs at Fantina were a bit… merde. She leads off with Duskull and we start with Meditite. After a Shadow Sneak and a Pursuit, it's an easy one shot for Asanan. This went much better than previous runs where Duskull started off with Will-O-Wisp. Fantina switches in her Miss Magius and we bring in Mara on our side. She uses Confuse Ray and Shadow Ball while we bide our time and in the end, the energy we unleash is more than enough. Her final Pokemon is Haunter and we've still got two full health Pokemon to work with, starting with Peepo. Our first bide comes up just short which is only made worse when she uses Hypnosis to put Primple up to sleep. We switch Surrey in because a sleeping Pokemon is basically dead in a challenge where you can't use items and bide as your only attack. Although he manages to chip away some more of Haunter's health, he eventually gets knocked out by Shadow Claw. That leaves us with just Mara. Yet again. We set up Bide and Haunter lands a Shadow Claw before going for Hypnosis once more. The move misses and Krikatoon has enough energy built up to end the match and earn us the Relic Badge. As we leave Heart Home to the east, we cross paths with Barry and our first battle with him goes a bit awry. When Bide is your only means of attacking, sometimes you just find yourself in a situation where you can't win. We take Barry's final Pokemon Ponyta into red health with three of our teams still standing, but we just don't have enough hit points left to survive two hits to finish the job. We actually had to grind up a bit before running this battle again, because we just weren't strong enough to take on Barry yet. When we get into the battle, Suri takes out Staravia in one, Peepo finishes off Weasel, Mara deals with Grodel, and after Ponyta knocks out Asanan, Brimplop has just enough left to complete the job. 
Our next port of call is at Veilstone City's gym to take on Maylene. The fighting type gym leader leads off with her level 28 meta type, and we send in Peepo. After tanking a rock tomb in a drain punch, his bide knocks out the little asinine clone with ease. That leads to Maylene sending in her ace, Lucario. We switch out to Mara, and it really shouldn't come as a shock at this stage that she absorbed two hits and then fired back to one-shot the aura Pokemon. Machoke comes in last, and we go into Pachirisu. He gets off one bide, but it only cuts away about half of Machoke's health before the fighting type gets the better of Suri. Asanan comes in and just about survives two strengths to do his part and finish off Maylene. With that, we've earned our fourth badge, and it's time for another grinding session. Yay! We need to level up a bit before taking on Barry again, and at 36, Peepo evolves for the final time into Empoleon. One level later, Asanan gets the same treatment and evolves into Medicham. For the time being, our whole team are fully evolved, and now we can take on Barry. This one went pretty smoothly, but it took a really long time, so let's just skim through and skip ahead to our gym battle here in Pastoria. Crash Awake leads off with his Gyarados, and Peepo goes chasing waterfalls, refusing to stick to the rivers and the lakes that he's used to. I know that he's going to have it his way or nothing at all, but it certainly isn't moving too fast. It takes a while, but eventually, Empoleon takes down the water flying type. Next up for the masked man is Quagsire, so we switch into Mara. Once again, we take advantage of our weakness to rock type moves and obliterate Quagsire with one bide. The final member of Crash Awake's team is his level 37 Float Soul. We bring in Suri, and it seems like our first bide will be perfect. Two crunches take Pachirisu down to 8 HP, meaning the energy unleashed from Bide will deal 178 hit points of damage to Float Soul. Unfortunately, for the first time in the game, we encounter the pain of priority moves. Float Soul's Aqua Jet lets him get in a third hit before he can use Bide, and Suri goes down. That leaves us with our newly evolved Medicham. Two more crunches take Asanan down to 3 HP, and luckily, this time around, Float Soul doesn't go for Aqua Jet, for some reason. Bide knocks out Crash Awake's final Pokemon, and we can add the Fen Badge to our case. Then we reach that peculiar part of Platinum, where a Team Galactic Crunch just sets off a bomb inside the Great Marsh. There will be another bomb to deal with later on, but for now we just need to chase this guy down and beat his Krogunk. It actually gives us way more trouble than I thought it would, but eventually we take it out and then head to Celestic Town to face off against Cyrus. This is our first meeting with the Galactic Boss, but I really need to take a minute to relax before what will prove to be the most frustrating battle ever, maybe. This battle with Cyrus wasn't too bad, but it was nothing compared to what's coming next. It was also much easier than when I played through this game with only Mime Jr., so at least there's that. Anyway, we took down the Galactic Leader at the first time of asking, and then we made our way to Camelave City to take on Barry. You know, there's a scene in Return of the King where Frodo and Sam are at Kirith Ungol, and when the camera cuts between the two characters, you're watching shots that were filmed a year apart. That all happened because of floods that went down during filming, and it's basically the same situation here. Although one transition separates each of these battles, it feels like they were filmed about a year apart. With Barry adding a fifth Pokemon to his team, this entire battle has become essentially impossible. I kept trying, but I just needed to continue grinding. I don't know if I've mentioned this yet, but grinding with Bide isn't fun. At all. Not one bit. I didn't want to double up on Pokemon either. Prior to beating the champion, there are only six different fully evolved Pokemon that you can get in Platinum that can learn Bide, but two of them are not available yet. We just need to push on and beat Barry by sheer force of will. Once I leveled the whole team up into the mid 50s, I came back and ran through my bag just to show how many items Suri found using pickup while I was grinding. When you have a Pokemon with pickup, there's a 1 in 10 chance that they'll be holding an item after each battle you complete, as long as they're not holding one already. Throughout this playthrough, I think Pachirisu picked up around 500 items, including a bunch of rare candies, 4 copies of the TM for rest, and in this grinding session alone, 19 different evolution stones. Each one of those has a 1 in 250 chance of spawning after each battle completed, so yeah, this part of the game was the worst. Anyway, let's get into the battle. Barry leads off with his Staraptor, who just insists on using Double Team over and over again to start the battle. It makes no difference because Bide can't miss, but it's a fun little thing he does to start every single battle that makes them about 10 minutes longer. Eventually, he hits Mara with a couple of Aerial Aces and falls to Bide. Our mortal enemy sends in his Rapidash next, and we leave Krikatoon in on our side. Not sure why, I'm fairly certain I'd lost my mind at this point. I think maybe I wanted the extra recoil damage on Rapidash, I guess? Anyway, Mara gets knocked out, so we bring in Empoleon, and he gets to watch the Fire Horse whip his tail back and forth. This actually benefits us, so I'm not going to complain. 
It at least serves a purpose unlike Growl or Double Team. After a few turns we bide and eat up two takedowns which do just enough for our retaliation to knock Rapidash out. Heracross is up next for Barry and we go into Suri. One bide and two brick breaks later and Heracross is laying flat on his back with spirals for eyes. Barry's first ever Pokemon Torterra comes out next and we actually stay in with Pachirisu. A couple of hits take Suri down to 1 HP which allows him to knock out Torterra with bide. That leaves Barry with just his float soul so we go back out to Empoleon. This took a while because Aquajet wasn't doing much to Peepo, but eventually we got the better of him to win the battle. This was an intensely emotional moment for me. I was working on this battle for more than a week. I seriously considered just giving up on this whole video about 10 times. Anyway, let's finally move on to the Candle Lake Gym Leader and forget about this battle forever. Now that we're seriously overleveled, I wasn't expecting much of a challenge from Byron. We lead off with Asanam and the Steel type specialist starts with Magneton. Our first bide wipes it out and we decide to stay in against Steelix. Two flash cannons from the Steel Snake Pokemon can't finish Medicham off though. The energy from bide knocks out Steelix and takes Byron down to just one. His son Rourke gave us a lot of trouble back in Orberg City, but with three healthy Pokemon left, it's not going to be like father like son. We bring in Mara to face off against Byron's Bastiodon, hoping to once again take advantage of her weakness to rock type moves. After a few iron defences, Bastiodon fires off a stone edge which does more than enough damage for our bite to end the battle and earn us badge number 6. We're so close now. Not really though. Team Galactic then set off another bomb which is troubling, so we head to Lake Valor to take on the Galactic Commander, Saturn. This isn't particularly important though so let's skip over it and the subsequent battle with Mars at Lake Verity. Now that we can pass through Mount Coronet and reach Route 216, we can pick up a female snow run and get two new team members. The Barry battle showed me that I needed as many Pokemon as possible, so we put the snow run we caught in the daycare with Suri to breed some snow runs that no bide. The first one we hatch is female, so we nickname her Lassie and evolve her with one of the many, many, many Dawnstones Pottery's who was picked up. Our next snow run that hatches is going to be our Glalie, and I need you to know how tired and disoriented I was at this point because we nicknamed him Testicle. Testicle? I don't know, let's just call him Testy. Now, I was getting ready for another obscenely long grinding session when something incredible and ridiculous happened. I realised that our four old team members had all contracted Pokeros. If you don't know what Pokeros is, it's basically a virus that your Pokemon can get that doubles the EVs earned from any given battle. You've got approximately a 1 in 21,845 chance of this happening after a battle, and in all my years of playing Pokemon, it's only ever happened once. This is rarer than finding a shiny. Anyway, it's pretty easy to pass along, so one battle later we've got Lassie and Testy sick and we can get on with grinding. It makes it a little easier to get EVs in the stats I want, so I definitely appreciate that. It certainly doesn't make grinding any less painful though. Towards the end of this slog, I met a trainer who was just repeating the words, I'm strong, over and over again. It really felt like they were trying to inspire me in my time of need. It gave me a new burst of energy and with that we were able to get over the line. Just outside Celestic Town, Testy took down a self-destructing Graveler who got him up to level 42, causing him to evolve into Glalie and finally become the Testicle we all know and love. Once I'd leveled him and Lassie up to 50, I continued on with the journey and reached Snowpoint City where we faced off against Candice. Or maybe it's supposed to be Candice. Like Price. And Bryson. That's kind of dumb though. Anyway, she leads off with her Sneasel and we start with Testy. It takes a while after she survives our first bide and Candace heals her up with a Hyper Potion, but eventually Testy manages to take her down. With a full team of 6, we're really not likely to lose any time soon, but this one took a really long time so we're going to speed it up a lot. Candace healed a fair bit and we got unlucky a few times, but eventually we made it through the battle with our whole team standing and the Icicle Badge in hand. Our next destination is the summit of Mount Coronet, where we're challenged to a double battle by Mars and Jupiter. Barry's on our side for this one and it's not too bad. But it took like 10 minutes, so we're gonna skip it too and move on to the Distortion World. I really love this place. It's one of my favourite areas in any Pokemon game, even though it's a bit of a nightmare to traverse at times. Like, seriously, just look at this. With the help of the Late Guardians, we locate Cyrus and he wants another battle. He leads off with his Houndoom and we send out Surrey for starters. We set up Bide and Houndoom's Flamethrower takes out a lot of Pachirisu's health. A second one would definitely finish him off, but Cyrus goes with Will-O-Wisp instead, and it fails. That gives us a free win that we probably didn't deserve. Next up for the Team Galactic Leader is Gyarados, so we bring in Mara. This one is a much simpler affair. 
A couple of waterfalls chunk away 160 HP from Krikatoon, so the Bide we fire back is good for 320 hit points of damage, more than enough to take out Gyarados. Honchkrow is out third, and we send in Peepo to face it. Our first Bide isn't quite enough to one-shot because Heatwave isn't doing too much to Empoleon. We just get incredibly lucky here though. Honchkrow misses Heatwave on the turn between Bides, and then hits after we use it, then misses again once he's done enough damage to knock himself out. This really couldn't have gone any better. Honchkrow goes down, leaving Empoleon with over 100 HP to work with. We Viles out next, and we stick with Peepo. Our first attack gets him below half health, but he's able to heal up a bit and then knock us out before taking a second hit. We bring in Tasty, who eats up a couple of shots before unleashing a killer buy to take Cyrus down to one. Crobat's out last for the Galactic Leader, and we send in Asanan. I can honestly say I've never been so outplayed by AI in a Pokemon game as I was at the start of this face-off. We use Bide and the Poison Flying type completely negates it by using Toxic and Confuse Ray. We're now badly poisoned and confused, and in the post by turn he hits us with an Air Slash. In one go, he's completely ended Medichan's battle. With only 50 HP remaining and Toxic in effect, there's no way we can survive long enough to Bide. We make a couple of switches, but Glalie and Pachirisu both go down to Crobat as well, without doing any damage. All of a sudden, it's gone from a 5 on 1 to a 3 on 1, with one Pokemon essentially unusable. Crobat hasn't taken a single point of damage. Lassie really needs to show up here. Our first bite is made up of an Air Slash and a Confuse Ray, but Frostlass breaks through Confusion to hit the bat and take him below half health. She even avoids an Air Slash after Bide's energy is released. It's a really strong start. Still, we're confused. We have to switch Asanan back in and sacrifice him to give ourselves a chance. When Medicham falls, we bring Frostlass back in to finish this. After she sets up Bide, we manage to just survive two Air Slashes to knock out Crobat and beat Cyrus. This one really came down to the wire. By the end, our team of six Pokemon had just over 50 HP remaining. All together. This was one of the most intense battles I've had in these challenges, and there have been some incredible ones. Before leaving the Distortion World, we come face to face with Giratina. As we approach, it screeches, Gigoga Gogwo. I think it's Welsh for, don't you come any closer, bitch? We ignore the command because I don't speak Welsh, and when it appears in front of us, it screeches the haunting words, Gigog a go goo. I'm not even going to tell you what that one means because I don't want this video to get demonetized. Instead of biding my time and giving him more of a platform to say stuff like that, we just throw a Master Ball and trap him inside forever. Hopefully that will teach him some manners. Our journey is almost at an end now. Well, kind of. Back in the real world, we make our way to Sunny Shore City, and after locating Volkner, we convince him to return to the gym. With a whole lot of build-up, I really expected more of Volkner, but he just isn't up to much. He leads off with Jolteon, who is easily bested by Glalie, Raichu can't do much to Peepo, in no time at all, he's down to two. Luxray almost gets the better of Suri, but nope. Pachris who wipes him out in one, leaving just Electivire. We send in Asanan, who takes a 1-2 of Thunder Punches and then hits back twice as hard, knocking out Electivire and earning us our 8th and final badge. So, I didn't record anything from Victory Road because it's not really important and there was already like 40 hours of footage. So we're at the Pokemon League and we're taking on Barry. His first Pokemon is Staraptor and we send in Lassie. A crit Steel Wing means we're good for almost 250 HP of damage with our Bide. It one-shots Staraptor and forces Barry to send in Rapidash. We go for a risky move and send in Testy. Rapidash starts off with Sunny Day, so when he uses Fire Blast, Glalie has to survive an incredibly strong, powered up, super effective move. He just about lives through it, and the energy from Bide is more than enough to take Rapidash down. Hera crosses up third, and we go into Asanan. After using Bide, Medicham has to absorb two Aerial Aces before taking aim for another win. Snorlax comes out fourth for Barry, and we go into Peepo. With rest in his moveset and a lot of HP at his disposal, we really need to take him down at the first time of asking. If we don't, we basically lose. Empoleon bides through two Earthquakes and releases 320 HP of damage onto Snorlax to knock him out and take our rival down to two. He sends in his starter next and we go into the Pokemon that made this adventure possible. A Leaf Storm and a Crunch from Torterra take Mara down to 98 HP, enough damage for another one hit KO. Floatzel comes in last for Barry, and we leave Krikatoon in because her HP is still respectable. A couple more crunches can't knock her out, so by one shots again and finishes the battle without us needing to send in Surrey. This took quite a few attempts, mainly because Snorlax was a bit of a nightmare to deal with using only Bide. 
With Barry out of the way, we can move on to the Elite Four after a small bit of grinding. Or lots. One of the two. We start off against Aaron, and this took almost 10 minutes because his Vespaquen is an asshole. I don't really want to give him the time of day by commentating over this battle, so instead I'm just going to read you some of my favourite items from the B-Movie trivia section on IMDb. Hopefully none of it is about Vespaquen. Let's get into it. All the bees in the movie either sport buzz cuts or beehive hairdos. Fascinating. Paul Rudd was considered for the role of Barry B. Benson. Remarkable. According to Jerry Seinfeld, while having lunch at Steven Spielberg's house, he first mentioned the idea for the movie's a joke, but Spielberg loved it. Splendiferous. Okay, that's, that's about it. There aren't many interesting things in here. Let's just move on to the script. According to all known laws of aviation, there is no way a bee should be able to fly. Its wings are too small to get its fat little body off the ground. The bee, of course, flies anyway, because bees don't care what humans think is impossible. Yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, black. Ooh, black and yellow. Let's shake- oh, we're done. Good. We beat Aaron and can finally move on to the second member of the Elite Four, Bertha. She leads off with Whiskash and we send in Suri. Two Earth powers later and Pachirisu is knocking out the Whiskered Whale with Bide. Hippowdon is up next and after sending in Glalie, we actually switch back to Suri because I had a feeling she'd go for Yawn. That's exactly what ends up happening, so we let Pachirisu go down so we can get a free switch back into Testy and then start again from square one. This time our bite is met by a double dose of Stone Edge which lets us fire back for an easy knockout. Bertha sends in Golem third and after some deliberation we go out to Lassie. After using Bide, Golem goes for back to back fire punches which aren't quite enough to take down Frostlass. It does cause enough damage to mean Bide is destroying another foe though. A combination of a burn and a sandstorm take out Lassie too, but she's done her job. Bertha's penultimate Pokemon is Rhyperior, so we bring out Peepo. An avalanche and an earthquake take Empoleon into red health, meaning the buyer that he fires off is dealing over 400 hit points of damage. Obviously that's enough to take out Rhyperior, so Bertha's down to 1. Only Gliscor remains now. We send in Mara, and after Bide, we're hit by a Firefang which chips away around a third of Krikatoon's health. Unfortunately, the second Firefang is a crit, and leaves Mara with just one hit point remaining. Usually that would be perfect for a Bide user, but on this occasion, the Raging Sandstorm takes Mara out before the energy can be unleashed. We're forced to send in Asanan as our only healthy remaining Pokémon. Gliscor uses two Earthquakes while Medicham is Biding, and when it doesn't knock him out, our attack eliminates her, finishing off Bertha in the process. That's two down, and Flint's up next. As I walked into his room to face him, it occurred to me for the first time that half of my team were weak to fire type moves. For some reason I'd never really considered it. Anyway, I'm sure this will be fun. The starting battle sees Houndoom face off against Frostlass. After Bide, Flint calls for Sunny Day, which is pretty much perfect as it means the flamethrower that follows does a ton of damage but isn't enough to knock out Lassie. As a result, we have another massively powerful Bide that comfortably deals with Houndoom. Flareon is up next for Flint, and we choose Suri to be our second Pokemon. He bides his way through one overheat, but the evolution can't make contact a second time. Luckily for us, the energy unleashed does enough to knock him out. For Flint's Infernape, we send in Asanan on our side. While we're biding, Infernape takes a fair chunk of damage from Flare Blitz, and with Medicham surviving two hits, it's another win for our team. This is going shockingly well. Rapidash comes out fourth, and we send in Mara. The first Flare Blitz takes Krikatoon down to 1 HP, but more importantly, the recoil damage wipes out more than half of Rapidash's hit points. A second hit finishes off Mara, but she's done her job. Testy comes in and eats a hit which takes Rapidash even lower thanks to recoil. Flint is forced to heal him up for the second turn of Bide, and that means Glalie's attack knocks Rapidash out and leaves the third Elite Four member with just one Pokemon. For Magmortar, we send Pachirisu back in, and after a Solar Beam, Bide cuts Flint's final Pokemon down to around half health. Before a second Bide, Suri goes down, so we switch into Peepo. Empoleon uses Bide, and Magmortar's Solar Beam does enough for us to get the win. We're down to the final member of the Elite Four, Lucian. Mr. Mime is up first for the Psychic-type Specialist, and we start with Empoleon. After our first Bide fails thanks to Reflect and Light Screen, we take three Thunderbolts, and our second attempt finishes him off. Gallade comes in next, and we call Peepo back, and send in Testy. A couple of Stone Edges take Glalie down to red health, but that just means Gallade's battle is done. A 444 HP Bide absolutely annihilates the level 59 Psychic Fighting type. That forces Lucian to send in Bronzong, and we counter with Suri. Luckily, our risky move works out, as Bronzong starts with a Calm Mind before going for an Earthquake. 
That means Pacharis who is alive and well when Bide is ready to go, and the energy unleashed earns us another victory. With two Pokemon remaining, Lucian sends in his Espeon, and we go out to Lassie. Once again, we Bide through two big hits, and in surviving, guarantee an easy knockout. Two Shadow Balls give us a simple one-shot, and leave Lucian with just one Pokemon. Alakazam comes out last, and we bring in Mara. His first Psychic knocks off less than half of Krikatoon's HP, so it looks like we're in good shape. A ridiculous high roll on the second Psychic ends up wiping out Mara though, so now we're basically down to a one-on-one. -on -one. Asanam comes in, and this may shock you, but he uses Bide. Two Psychics can only take Medicham into orange health, so Alakazam is knocked out and the Elite Four are defeated. Now, only the champion remains. Unlike our previous challengers, Cynthia will have a full team of six, so this is a major step up in terms of difficulty. There's no point in delaying it any longer. I'm just writing the script right now, but I feel like we must be about nine hours into this video, so let's do this. Cynthia, Cynthia, leads off with Spiritomb, and we begin the final battle with a Pokemon who started it all. Peepo can take Spiritomb's hits really well, so our first bite does a good deal of damage after taking a Shadow Ball and a Dark Pulse. A couple more Shadow Balls on bite number two deal enough damage to give us a bite capable of knocking out Spiritomb. The next matchup sees Garchomp facing off against Lassie. The first Dragon Rush cuts away 109 of Frostlass's 220 HP, so a high roll will almost certainly finish her off. Instead, we get a low roll and survive on 6 HP, allowing a powerful bite that obliterates the pseudo-legendary dragon. So far, so good. Lucario comes in third, and we sub in Asanan on our side. Two non-stab Shadow Balls aren't enough to take out Medicham, so we get another easy knockout with Bide. Cynthia's fourth Pokemon is Togekiss, so we send out Suri. While Pachirisu is Biding, two Aura Spheres cut away exactly half of his health. I can only imagine the 200 HP Bide was just about the exact amount we needed to knock out Togekiss, so a couple of weak Aura Spheres probably would have changed the whole rhythm of this battle. Instead, we've knocked out four of the champion's team and we're still looking good. Cynthia's penultimate Pokemon is Milotic, and we choose Mara on our side. The Majestic Water type tries to use Mirror Coat right off the bat, which is pretty useless against Bide, and her follow-up Surf cuts away half of Krikatoon's health. The damage helps us knock out Milotic with Bide and take Cynthia down to one. Roserade is brought in on the champion side, and we leave Mara in because I really wanted to eke out as much damage as possible, and she still had a decent amount of HP. Unfortunately, it was pointless. One Sludge Bomb destroys Krikatoon and we're forced to go into Testy. After he sets up Bide, Roserade uses Toxic and I'm immediately terrified. If Cynthia decides to stall from here, I can't win. Luckily, the Pokemon AI is amazing and she uses Sludge Bomb on the second turn of Bide. The damage dealt is enough for us to hit back and take down Cynthia's last Pokemon in one. The champion is defeated, and somehow, some way, we've beaten Pokemon Platinum using only Bide. This was a terrible idea. I mean, I'm glad someone did it, I just wish it wasn't me. Getting through the Elite Four and Champion in the 60s using only Bide seems pretty crazy in retrospect, but that's the power of the most painful move in Pokemon. It can deal serious damage when wielded against AI that doesn't entirely understand what's happening. Usually I end these off by saying I had a lot of fun, but I really didn't with this one. It was a difficult slog, but the feeling of relief when that Roserade fainted is unlike anything I've ever felt before. The part of this challenge that you don't think about when you start is the mental test that you have to pass. I really liked using this team though. I think Empoleon is the only member who I've actually used in a playthrough before this, and I came to like all of these Pokemon a lot. If you stuck around this long, I can't thank you enough. I make these videos to hopefully entertain and answer dumb questions, and if you had fun, that's what's important. Also, if you watch the whole thing, it helps out with the algorithm more than basically anything else, so thank you for that. Our team has been inducted into the Hall of Fame, and the credits have officially rolled, so all that's left for me to say is thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.